Well, well first off, I have a very difficult time talking about myself. Um, and um, when I interviewed Dr. Ribley some time ago, uh, he and I were talking about the fact that unlike so many people that would like to have legacies when they leave and you know, a plaque or a statue or a picture on the wall, that's never been a motivation for me. Um, I just love to get the work done. Uh, and I've always felt that characters build things. Uh, the problem with most characters is they build things around them so that when they're gone they fall apart. And while I love characters who build things, and we at Life University have got a lot of characters here and we love them, we want them to come put their uh, brick, so to speak, on the wall and, and make it grow and then when they're gone, someone picks up and takes over for them. So I think a couple of things. One is I hope that we build an organization here that, while that may not be a glitzy answer, uh, continues the vision of Life University because the vision is bigger than all of us. I think the second thing is um, there are some things that I'm really proud of that we've done. I've always been interested in spreading chiropractic uh, to, to patients and more so now around the world. Uh, early on with my associate, Dr. Felicia, when we did Renaissance, uh, we had a program that taught research and philosophy uh, and the big picture of chiropractic and then showed chiropractors how to communicate that to patients. And in 1977, we brought the first educational programs on video for any profession uh, to chiropractic. And this was back in a time when only 10% of Americans had a VCR. We'd have seminars and chiropractors wanted to go home and show the videos but we had to bring videos to the seminar to give to them so they'd have something to play them on when they got, got home. And then of course we created Quest, uh, which was a, an expansion of that. We were managing 7,000 offices. But again, it was about spreading the word of chiropractic. And then when Palmer asked me to be the president, ultimately the chancellor there, it was a way of saying, gosh, instead of doing it one-on-one -on -one with chiropractors, we can prepare uh, students who will go out and do this forever in an institution that will carry it forward. And no place has that been forwarded more than here at Life University with now opening up colleges in uh, Rome and China and Costa Rica. Uh, you know, we have about 68,000 chiropractors in the United States, uh, 7,000 in Canada. By comparison, we have a million one medical doctors in the United States. Uh, we obviously need more chiropractors and get our message out. Uh, but then you get to Australasia, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia. There's about 3,500 chiropractors there. Uh, the European Union, which is 700 million people, twice the size of the United States, has 5,000 chiropractors. And, um, and then you get to China, 1.3 billion people. On mainland China, there's eight chiropractors there. Uh, India, 1.3 billion people, there's about 20 chiropractors there. So, you know, the fact that we now, I get to take uh, at the helm of this, uh, this idea and vision and spread it around the world uh, will just be something at the end of my life uh, that if I was going to be known for something that's probably what it would be which is that we took chiropractic and literally spread it all over the planet. All right, uh, what project are you working on now or have worked on recently that you're most excited about? You know a lot of the projects we work on they get very public um, but it's oftentimes the ones that aren't so public that I think are going to have the greatest impact. Uh, when I got to life, we created a, a think tank called the Octagon. Uh, and it, the Octagon, obviously, it has eight different departments or components. Uh, it came out of an article I read on a newspaper one day when I was flying around. Uh, it was a medical doctor who, an unethical one, who uh, had had stomach problems, so he self-diagnosed, self-prescribed and diagnosed himself incorrectly, therefore prescribed incorrectly. The drugs ate holes in his stomach. He couldn't practice medicine any longer. And he found an unethical attorney, and together they dreamed up a scheme to rip off the insurance company. So he went to court, both as the patient uh, and as the doctor, as the plaintiff and the defendant. So they put him on, this, on the stand as the patient first, swore him in as the patient. And he showed how his life had been wrecked by this incompetent doctor who had misdiagnosed him, uh, prescribed incorrectly, uh, destroyed his life, he couldn't work any longer, how much money he was losing. They took him off the stand, brought him back up as the doctor, and then the attorney grilled him, proving that he was an incompetent doctor. And they won two and a half million dollars, remarkably, because of a loophole in the insurance laws. And I thought to myself that day when I was flying around, 
uh, gosh, are we graduating students from Life University to go out with all the privileges that an education has, and especially in the chiropractic program, the financial privileges that that implies, only to go out and rip off the system. And that's not an issue of education, that's an issue of uh, character and, and integrity. So I wrote on the airplane that day eight values, like integrity and citizenship, uh, leadership, entrepreneurship, and came back to the institution and asked the provost at the time, what do you think about teaching these in the curriculum? And so we did, we put them in the curriculum in our undergrad program. Every student in the undergrad program takes courses in all eight of these values, if you will. Um, and in the chiropractic program, they take either classes or seminars on them. Um, and so we decided, you know what, one of the greatest conversations, for example, in the world today is integrity. Uh, if you watch the six o'clock news and follow the stories on there, they all start with a breakdown in integrity. And what our world would be like, our culture would be like, our society would be like if people lived with integrity. And so that's the first of these values, integrity and citizenship. Um, and so we thought, what would happen if we got the world's greatest leaders together in that, this area and had a conversation, had forums, uh, wrote white papers, uh, developed curriculum, uh, developed uh, ways of measuring integrity in our politicians and in media. And so we thought, let's take all eight of these areas and carry on the world's greatest conversations in all eight. And so we started doing that. Uh, we first thought we'd have to build the building, get all the people accumulated, and then you know, have the, the endowed chairs and, and integrity and vitalism and healthcare policy. And then we thought, you know, you don't need the building to have the conversations. And so seven years ago, we started a five-year conversation. It happened on a yearly basis on vitalism. What was it? What does it mean? What was it, would its impact in healthcare be? Um, and literally, we sort of defined uh, out of that a center now on healthcare policy that's writing non-medical healthcare policy at the highest levels in the United States. Uh, in fact, because of that, I was invited to speak at uh, Senator Tom Harkin's retirement in Washington, D.C., uh, because that's been a big issue for him. Uh, there were eight of us invited to speak, and I was one of them uh, on behalf of uh, Senator Harkin. Uh, also, there's a large organization that writes alternative health care policy uh, that, out of Georgetown University, and uh, they decided to have their conference at Life University a couple of years ago out of respect for the phenomenal work we're doing in that area. So, uh, you know, that doesn't get a lot of play in the chiropractic press. No, it's not going to help you get a new patient, but it helps, is going to help us redefine healthcare policy. One of the other things the Octagon is doing now is we're having a five-year conversation on integrity. And after the first year, the experts, the, the uh, researchers, the writers, the academicians that we brought in uh, were so inspired by their conversation that we created a center for compassion, integrity, and secular ethics. And that uh, center now is doing a number of projects. One of them is uh, we're going to be the first university offering bachelor's degree in prisons because we know that education reverses to almost zero the recidivism rate. Pay, uh, prisoners getting out and then showing back up in prison. Uh, that starts this spring. Uh, I'm proud of that. Uh, one of the projects we're doing in the Center for Compassion, Integrity, and Secular Ethics is um, uh, working with a group out of Ireland uh, that's helping to break the generation of generation of generation of hate and retribution that comes in a lot of these war-torn areas uh, around the world. And we're working with a group that are called Children Caught in the Crossfire, an incredible guy by the name of Richard Moore, who at the, uh, a very young age was shot by a British soldier in Northern Ireland in one of the uprisings and was blinded for life and his parents however, raised him in an environment of compassion and forgiveness. And 33 years later, he met uh, the, the, uh, or the soldier who had shot him and publicly forgave him. Um, and, you know, his organization is incredible. And so we're hooked up with them. Uh, and both those projects have just been endorsed by the Dalai Lama, uh, who uh, uh, is going to be coming to our campus in the not too distant future because of the, some of the work we're doing. So it doesn't get a lot of play sometimes in the press. But I think the project of the Octagon is one of the things that is going to be most impactful for our world and you know, generated out of Life University. Then, of course, opening up the new schools in Rome, especially, which is 
scheduled to open in a couple of years, and then we're working uh, intimately with the government in China. Uh, we have a research center there at the largest university there, Harvard, if you will, called Xinhua, uh, getting phenomenal results, and we hope to pave the way for setting up chiro chiropractic licensure and a whole profession in that country. So those are some of the projects. Uh, and then you get down to some that uh, I spoke to the faculty group today called, I called it the big, the small, and the annoying. Uh, rather than the good, the bad, and the ugly, but the big, the small, and the annoying. You know, on a big scale, uh, we're putting in a new curriculum that's never been done before in our chiropractic program that will transform how chiropractic education is occurring. Uh, on somewhat of a smaller level, uh, our, our sports teams, for example, our rugby team, is now getting a world recognition. We're, we just received an article. We were just voted the number one rugby program in the United States. We have three players on the national team that will compete in the Olympics uh, next year in rugby. Uh, so, you know, while those may seem at certain times smaller projects, they still get life out there. They get chiropractic out there in front of the public. Uh, so th those are some of the things we're working on that we're really excited about. Uh, what's something that TCL readers and viewers might not know about uh, that you contributed as an icon of the chiropractic profession? Um, you know, I think it's interesting, and, and maybe arguably, uh, you know, right now there's a huge conversation. It's actually become part of our day-to-day -day lexicon in chiropractic, talking about vitalism. Um, and, and yet, that term had never been used in chiropractic uh, until I brought it in, uh, into the conversation. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Ian Coulter at the Rand Corporation at UCLA. And he wrote a book about the healthcare conversations going on in the world today. And in that book, he talked about one of the conversations is something called vitalism versus mechanism. Are we self-developing, self-healing, self-maintaining mechanisms? Uh, are we more than the physics and chemistry that make up our body? That's vitalism. Or are we uh, what the medical community would look at as a more mechanistic philosophy? They were just a machine that's going to break down, you diagnose it and you try to get the machine stimulated or up and running along the way with as little discomfort, disease, and pain as possible. Those are really conversations that are going on in the world that are redefining healthcare. And I remember reading that, uh, and I went and looked up the term vitalism in Wikipedia, and it says uh, it's a philosophy that believes that there's more to life than the physics and chemistry of the body. And then it says it's a philosophy that died the death of a thousand cuts. Uh, because. Uh, back 300 years ago when Newton showed up, uh, at that time we looked at the body as mind and spirit. But since research, researchers couldn't research spirit, life, if you will, you know, how do you put life underneath a microscope and uh, stain it and measure it? And so what 300 years ago science did was they said, we'll take the physical world, the physical sciences, and we'll develop that, which is what medicine is developed from. But they said, we, you know, we don't want to deal with this, this uh, non-material thing called life. And so they kind of said, that goes to religion. And so when Wikipedia says it died the death of a thousand cuts, it meant in science they couldn't research it. And so it began to be eliminated from the scientific conversation. And of course today now, that conversation about energy and its relationship to matter, Einstein and Born the gang put that all back into the equation. Uh, in somewhat scientific terminology. Uh, so it's a major part of the conversation. And it really, for me, uh, the first principle of chiropractic says there's an intelligence in all matter that gives to it its properties and actions and maintains it in existence. And that really is sort of the chiropractic version of vitalism. So when we go out, we're going out to talk to people uh, in the community, they had a hard time understanding concepts like universal intelligence. But we could talk to them in scientific terms of things like vitalism and mechanism. So as we started that conversation and then created the five-year conversation at life and you know the way we, way we and other people, myself, use it, it was sort of the introduction of that term and concept into our profession as a defining moment between us and other organizations. So I think that's probably somebody think, most people would probably think, gosh, that's been around forever, you know. But if you go back and look at a chiropractic text in 1930, you're not gonna find it. If you look at a chiropractic text in 1970, you're not going to find it. It's something that um, a few of us, and I think probably me because I'm more public, brought that concept into the profession. Uh, so 
something that probably nobody would know, and I probably don't want them to know that much. It's just happy for them to use the term and debate the concept. All right, great. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? You know, just a couple of things. Um, one of the things at, at the university is, besides our chiropractic program, we have five other buckets of uh, ways to express our mission statement uh, with nutrition, positive psychology, uh, functional kinesiology, functional neurology, and our business program that says, you know, in the old days, the, the ethos was um, have an innovative idea and figure out how to make a profit out of it. Uh, today, in positive businesses, have an innovative idea, run it like a good business, make money off of it, but create businesses that change people's lives and alter society. Social entrepreneurship is what I would call it. Um, the programs we've created at Life uh, are not just a typical nutrition program, a typical functional neurology program. Our psychology program, as an example, is not normal psychology which says wait till someone gets sick, wait till they have a problem, then do therapy with them, dismiss them. Uh, positive psychology says we get our brain working at positive versus neutral, negative, or stressed then we probably aren't going to have those problems and we can change what our relationship with the world is. But on a more academic look at that, one of the things that they talk about in positive psychology, there's only, there's only two species on the planet that uh, need relationships for their well-being and, and literally their survival. It's birds and mammals, of which we fall into the latter category. You know, if a fish spawns a thousand, uh, they call them fry, I call them fishlets, but a thousand fry out in the ocean, mom just swims off afterwards, they're on their own. But you can't have a child as a human being and just dump them in the woods and go on about your business and expect that they're going to survive. We know that we need relationships for our survival and for our health and well-being uh, as we grow up uh, and throughout life. Uh, we know, for example, that people that are in healthy relationships uh, have a higher quality and a longer quantity of life than people that are not in healthy relationships even if the relationship is with a pet. Uh, there's something about the need to connect as human beings that's important to us. So one of the questions we ask at the university, but especially in this, uh, in the psychology department at the center is, what are the best kind of relationships then for our re survival and well-being? Is it hate and retribution, uh, uh, you know, uh, anger, uh, et cetera? Or is it compassion, forgiveness, uh, integrity, etc. And there's enough in research that the answer to that is what's obvious to all of us, that we can be better, live longer, have healthier relationships. If it's based on compassion and forgiveness and reconciliation, people like Nelson Mandela have taught us that with the reconciliation councils he created in South Africa uh, at the end of apartheid. You know, everyone kind of expected there'd be a lot of retribution, but he held the line uh, even when it was not popular for reconciliation. So um, uh, the, the programs at the university are really unique uh, in world and life changing. Uh, and I remember um, uh, having, uh, because of one of the people, Brendan Osawa Da Silva, uh, who works in that department, uh, a private audience I had with the Dalai Lama uh, a couple of years ago, not even two years ago. Uh, and a, you have to understand that a private audience with him I was in a room that was about maybe 15 by 15. Um, and since when he's here, he's a head of state, according to the U.S. government, they provide him security. So there's 10 guys in black suits with earphones and talking in their wrists. Uh, in China, he's considered a terrorist. So they also provide him 10 people with military fatigues and automatic weapons and hand grenades and knives strapped all over their bodies. Then you have all the monks and then all the press that follows the Dalai Lama around and you cram them all in a 15 by 15 room, and that's a private audience with the Dalai Lama. And so uh, we were sitting there, and he's a jokester, if, if you know anything about the Dalai Lama. He, um, you know, so you know, I, we wanted to, I wanted to talk to him about the values in life and lasting purpose and giving, serving, and doing, and loving, and uh, vitalism and these things. And uh, you know, he wanted to talk and have some jokes along the way. So it was a great audience with him. Um, and when you meet him, they give you a 10-foot, really beautiful, white, flowing scarf. And when he comes in the room, he takes it from you, uh, says a prayer over it, then puts it around your neck. Uh, and at the end of it, I had given him 
the night before I kind of panicked. I thought, gosh, am I supposed to take him a gift? Um, and, you know, and probably a life t-shirt wouldn't be a good idea. You know, that probably wouldn't be necessarily something of value. And a few years ago, decades ago, I, before they pulled down the Berlin Wall, I was there with all the college students during those evenings when they kept getting more and more uh, overt about sitting on the wall and chipping away at the wall and knocking holes in the wall. And I'd come back from that with a piece of the Berlin Wall. So I broke off a piece of it a few years ago and gave it to my dad who was at D-Day, I found out. And the other piece I broke off uh, and gave it to the Dalai Lama. And uh, so we did all of that. And at the end of it, um, exchanging gifts and talking about values. We said, we'd love to have you come to life based on all these projects we're working on. And he said, okay. Um, and of course then all of his staff go crazy because now they've got to get names and addresses and come up with flight schedules, and you know, all the things that make his schedule work to show up at a place like this. And then you stand up uh, afterwards and uh, you face the press and he holds hands with you and that's their sign to start taking pictures. They don't necessarily know who you are, but they figure if you have a private audience with the Dalai Lama and he's holding your hands, uh, that you know you must be important. They ought to take a picture. And I remembered when I was standing there, uh, 15 years ago, uh, two MDs uh, did something that they weren't supposed to do with my daughter, and she died on an operating table. And I have to tell you, I carry around a lot of anger. Um, about those two guys. Um, if I would have ever faced them, I, I can't tell you I wouldn't have had some retribution. Um, and we didn't talk about it all uh, with the Dalai Lama, but standing there with him after that, I knew it was done. So uh, that's Life University to me. Uh, it really is about a bigger picture than just uh, sending out people with diplomas to practice in the world and have great jobs. It's about that. We put out the best graduates in the world, but it's about something bigger than that. So, I, my last comment to your question is, I'd like to thank uh, all the people. Uh, we went through about 200 names uh, to come up with people we think are going to be stars in the future. Uh, people like Dr. Ribley that are icons now based on what they did when you know they were younger and it held the line for a lifetime. Um, so we picked out of that those that we thought were really the mavericks, icons, and geniuses of our profession. And I just want to thank them, one, for their contribution, uh, and also taking the time to help us put this uh, TCL together. Uh, I think it'll be one for the ages. Thank you. My pleasure.